morning. Yeah. Oh my, having come back from a wonderful trip to South Africa and now to get back in the routine, it's difficult. But I have a, a week, right, to readjust. And, uh, and then I'll be back on, on duty uh, next Sunday. And while I've been away, I've been thinking about maybe a sermon series. And the, so I've decided that it's going to be based on uh, the hymns that you all know. And the first one for next Sunday is um, one that you will be familiar with. And I will also incorporate some slides of our trip. So I think you're going to really enjoy it. And that's going to set the tone then for our sermon series. So I don't want to spill any beans, but I think it would be a good time for you all to uh, invite someone to come to church. It's, uh, summer is here. I'm looking forward to uh, playing uh, chair volleyball. And so we're going to, um, you know, celebrate this, this season that God has put us in and, and do some different things uh, during the summer as we worship together. But it's good to be back. Thank you for the opportunity for some rest and... Uh, and also to celebrate our 30th wedding anniversary. Truly a trip of a lifetime. Today, I knew, uh, I, I got back last night. I've been up for about, I don't know, 36 hours. I had a little bit of, of sleep, but I had contacted a dear friend, Reverend Norman Coleman, and I have known Norm for well over 30 years. We went to seminary together. Uh, in fact, uh, before, uh, he proposed to his wife. He came to me and said, I know the woman I'm going to marry. So Julie is his wife. Julie, will you stand up, please, to be recognized? And uh, so we went to seminary together, and he has, uh, he's now retired. I told him, you know, I should be retired, but I'm just starting back. So, uh, <laughs> so now I'm in your shoes, right? And when I leave this congregation, I'll be in his shoes. Amen. Um, so we've known each, each other for over 30 years. We went to seminary together. Uh, he has uh, served over 10 churches in, in the uh, conference. So uh, I told him that you will give him a warm welcome. I don't know what he's preaching on today, but it truly is a, a, a joy to, to be reunited uh, with dear friends. So, Sue, I'll let you carry on with us a few announcements. Good morning, all. We do have just a couple of announcements. Number one, if you have a call on your heart to help with Sunday school or nursery, they do need additional volunteers. Please see Diane or Rita is somewhere here. Raise your hand. They're sitting together over there. They're waiting to talk to you. And we have chair volleyball that will be starting Wednesday the 14th at 2 p.m. If you are interested, it's not too late to join that fun activity. It's going to be fun, right? And let's see. Pantry item for the week is toilet paper and grocery bags as usual. And then Jennifer has a video she would like to cover a few announcements on. So if you want to play Jennifer's video now. Good morning. It's me, your friendly computer technician. I want to thank you for all of the efforts you have done in collecting recycled pill bottles. It sure has made a difference in the ministries at Matthew 25 and there's actually been some changes. You might notice things are a little different at the supermarket these days. Well, there's changes in the recycling industry too. It's not profitable to collect the pill bottles and recycle them. So any pill bottles that look like this, that are over the counter or white or something, those we're just gonna go ahead and put in the re Rumpke recycling. There's no need to recycle them. They're not useful in the processes that Matthew 25 is doing. But these pill bottles, these amber, these orange pill bottles, those are the ones that we want. It doesn't matter if there's a label on or off, that's fine. But we're taking these kind of pill bottles, these orange and amber ones. They're going to be placed in their bags to go with medical supplies. So actually used as pill bottles for somebody else in the future. 
item number two. Thank you for all of the contributions for the Rumpke bin that's outside. It's been wonderful. We could use some more sponsors. So if you'd like to sponsor us for a month or a week, that would be great. It costs approximately $45 for a month to have the band come and pick up the recycling. So that would be just perfect. Three, you may notice there, there's a sign-in sheet on the front door when you came in. It lists the people that we have a blue card from. If your name's not on that list, then we still would like for you to fill out a blue card. So please make sure you check that orange list. The ushers have extra blue cards and they're happy to pass them out. We're trying to gather information about those in our congregation. So one, looking for amber pill bottles. Two, could use some sponsors for that $45 a month or sponsors for a week for the recycling bin. And three, have you filled out a blue information card? Those are the three things I wanted to share with you today. Take care. I also want to thank all those who uh, helped uh, with the worship services. I was told that uh, you all were truly blessed by them. So uh, thank you for all those who led uh, the last two worship services. Will you please stand and join with me in our call to worship? Lift up your voice and call out to God. We cry out, believing that God hears us. Come together and wait for God. We come together, trusting that God is still speaking. Surely God's presence is here and with us now. We wait in hope, for God's steadfast love lifts our hearts. Come, worship the Lord. We celebrate the power of God that restores us. Let us remain standing and sing our opening song of praise, God of grace and God of glory.
be seated. As I was sharing with Pastor Norm, I said we're not a fancy church, but we're a church family. And so now we come to our time uh, where we celebrate birthdays or anniversaries. Anybody having a birthday this week? All right, come on up, Dottie. Anybody else? Uh Aha. Sue? Take another birthday. (laughs) Happy birthday. When's your birthday? Saturday. Saturday. Mm -hmm. When's your birthday? Today. (gasps) Today. (laughs) So... So you get to join Jim now in double digits. Jim, she's joining you now in double digits. Oh, okay. You're not triple digits, right? No, no. Oh, I didn't think so. Okay. So Dottie, how old are you today? Ten. Ten. Dottie is ten. So happy birthday. Any anniversaries? Okay, so I asked uh, our guest preacher today, Norm, what he's going to preach on, and uh, I need for all the kids to come up, please. So kids, come on up. You're going to help me set the theme for today. Come on. All right. So I can remember when I was in school, and I think they probably do the same, although I don't know. Or maybe when you get together and you want to go play uh, a game together. Did anyone say, well, let's make a line and then we'll have someone stand here and someone stand here and you get to pick. Do you do that today? Yeah, you still do? Okay. You don't do that. I'm glad you don't do that and I'm going to tell you why in a minute. Good for you, right, Norm? Yeah. But I can remember as a kid just waiting. Is she going to pick me? Am I going to get picked? Uh, I know. Are you going to get picked? And everybody gets picked except what? One person, right? And here's that one person. Nobody picked me. Right? You had that feeling, oh, that feeling, how it felt when you were left out, that you didn't belong. Well, today, I want you to know that you belong. You belong to Jesus, and Jesus loves you very much, and Jesus wants you to be part of his family. A lot of us, we have the head knowledge of who Jesus is. We read our Bible, and and we hear the name Jesus, 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 but we want you to also have the heart knowledge of who Jesus is, that Jesus is your best friend, he's always going to be there, that you always uh, can belong, and and that's a choice that you're going to make, okay? So that's what we're going to be reminded of today, I I think, but I want you to know that uh, you're all, each of you are on God's team, okay? You're not left out, you're always on God's team, amen? Amen. Okay, so you can either go back to your seats or go to Sunday school. You having Sunday school day? Okay.
again, I want to thank you for uh, being so faithful in your giving. Uh, it, it's, it was nice to be able to go away and not have to wor worry about that. And so I ask that you will continue to support our ministries our, as we, you know, do a lot. Uh, we're going to be, be doing a lot more with our youth, uh, the food pantry. Now people are coming to, to garden, plant their, their gardens. And we continue to do um, many acts to those in our community with meals and, and providing other needs. So thank you. Uh, however, as summer is approaching, many of you will be on vacation. This typically is a, a time where finances tend to go down. But I have faith that uh, you will continue supporting our ministries, and I, I truly appreciate that. Uh, the ushers will now wait upon you for your tithes and your offerings.
a few uh, prayer concerns to share with you this morning, uh, praises and prayer concerns. The first praise comes from Christina. Praise for good test results. The test results from her CAT scan was positive, showing that the tumor has decreased in size. Uh, let us continue to keep uh, Tatum, uh, Rita's son, in our prayers. Um, apparently, th there's still uh, eyesight issues, so we need to pray for tight Tatum and his uh, eyes. And then sister's fiance, uh, Bobby. Bobby is in need of prayer. Uh, I have been reading all the text messages, but uh, he's really struggling right now. Um, dealing with cancer and other issues and infections. Uh, so let us remember Tatum and Bobby. Also, let us continue to pray for uh, uh, Bill Nicholson as he uh, is experiencing some health issues. And then yesterday when I was on the airplane, I was having a conversation with uh, the airline stewardess, and her father is 92 years old. And his name is Rudy, and um, he got COVID. So I said that I would share that with our congregation, and we will lift uh, Rudy up in prayer this morning. Any others? Thank you, Sue. So Verley Jones uh, passed away uh, while I was gone. Uh, Verley was 94. Also, uh, let us uh, continue to... Uh, keep Ginger's mother-in-law uh, in our thoughts and prayers, Judy Kohler. Um, and then also Ginger's brother, Howard. Uh, Howard is doing uh, better after the kidney transplant. Let us pray. God, we come to you this morning. Remindful once again that you are indeed our Savior. What a privilege it is, Lord, that we could call you Savior. You are always with us, Lord, in good times and in difficult times. And Lord, sometimes when it seems like the whole world is falling apart, you breathe breath into us. And you renew our spirits. So God, this morning as we gather, we ask for your Holy Spirit to move through this place. Hear our concerns, Lord. Touch those whom we have mentioned this morning. Continue to work and move through illnesses and, and situations which only you can do. We pray for guidance in our church family as we are uncertain about the future, but Lord, we know that you will pave a way for us. We're grateful for each and every one. We ask a blessing upon Norm as he comes to share the word with us today. We ask all of this, Father, in the name that in your name, and in the prayer that you have taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'm going to ask you to read the scripture. Good morning. I take it you can hear me okay? Praise God. Give an honor to God. And also uh, very grateful, giving honor to Andrea for the invitation to come today. 
Are we warm enough today? I just was just checking. We are in Ohio. Just want to make sure that you're on, on your best this morning. Uh, everybody wants to be wanted and accepted and belong. Is there anyone in here who doesn't want to belong? I'm just checking. We're going to have a special prayer meeting for you after service. Everyone wants to be picked. When I was growing up as a kid, I was not athletic. I'm not very athletic at all. I was the guy on the baseball team, the little league, who was in center field, and the ball came down, and I lost it in the sun, and it knocked me out, hit me in the head, fell over like a cartoon character. I was the guy who couldn't play basketball. In fact, it, it, it's so funny. I remember when I, uh, my first day at Mount Union uh, to go to college, freshman. A gentleman next to my dad said, what sport does your son play? He made some assumptions. You should not make assumptions. My dad told the gentleman that, uh, no, my son's here on academics. He was correct. I was the guy who could not play basketball. Nobody wanted to pick me. I'm the guy who they would pick all around, and I would be the last man standing, and the people who were going to get me weren't very happy. In fact, they weren't happy at all. I'm the guy who would just simply go in to foul somebody if you wanted them roughed up. That's how that worked for me. So I understand what it means not to be picked, not to be chosen. I was bullied uh, oftentimes in, 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 in junior high, uh, somewhat in high school, until one day a kid said he was going to kill me, and I panicked when I saw him. I threw him down on the concrete, banged his head two or three times, and then ran. The next day, he said he respected me. <laughs> Got away with that one. So I understand what it means sometimes not to be long. But before we get any more into this, let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we bless you and praise you for this beautiful day you've given us. We thank you, dear Lord, for the privilege and honor of gathering together in one for wherever two or more are gathered, dear Lord. We know that you are in our midst. And so, gracious Heavenly Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just fill me, move me, and guide me, uh, Father, uh, in my words, in my thoughts, in everything, Lord, so that as I am bringing the word, dear Lord, it is your word, not mine. As I'm bringing it, it will be honoring and building up to those who are listening and hearing to your praise and glory, for we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Lois Efren, who uh, wrote for um, Gallup, had in an article that said, the culture of belonging made the following statement. She said, if you have ever been relegated to a team by default because no one picked you, or worse yet, heard moans of disappointment as you joined them, you will know the importance of belonging. It is difficult to feel good about yourself, your circumstances, or perform well when feeling judged or rejected. On the contrary, belonging is about being respected, welcomed, and valued. That was in uh, 2022 that she had written this. It's important for us to understand that we all want to belong. We all want to belong. There's a term that I've heard uh, over the years, my people. Anybody ever used that term before? My, these are my people. In other words, they represent you. They may look like you. They may be in the same socioeconomic uh, stratosphere, I call it, or down below, wherever it may be. They may have the same education, the same interests, but these are what you would say. These are my people. These are the people who I hang out with and people I can get along with. They're my folk. We say that oftentimes about relatives, except for the ones we are upset with at that moment in time, and we say little about them. This passage here is really a, a passage that's oftentimes misunderstood. And so I'm going to read the passage to you as we begin to get into it. It's from 2 Chronicles chapter 7, and it's verses 11 through, excuse me, 15. As it is written, Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house. All that Solomon had planned to do in the house of the Lord and in his own house, he successfully completed. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, 
I have heard your prayer. I have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will hear, heal their land. This is something that I believe we desperately need in our country right now because we're going to a place without the hand basket and it needs to stop. But this is an important scripture for us as the church. And so I want to give you a little bit more of an overview of what is happening here before I get into an application and really get into the meaning of what this passage is. Here's kind of a general over, overview of it. God had made a covenant with David, King David. Now David's gone. He's, he's, died. he's dead. And God had made a covenant with him. And part of that covenant, there's a section where there is blessing and curses. The blessings come when you are obedient to God and you have no other gods before, before you. And when you do the things that are right in God's sight, then he would bless the land. And he also promised that that kingdom would perpetually move and move forward and grow. However, if you were disobedient, then God was going to come and he would, we would call discipline. I know we don't want to call going to the, what I call the woodshed. Some of y'all been to the holy woodshed. I mean, God had to take you there because you refused. Nothing else needs to be said. And so we have here that the Lord appeared to Solomon. He had already been praying. In fact, this is a response to what Solomon was praying about in chapter 6. But God came to him and assured him that his work on the temple and everything and his dedication was pleasing in his sight. And then he also encouraged Solomon by the promise that if his judgment came and should fall upon the nation for their sin, just as he had did for David, if they would only turn earnestly in humility to God and repent, that he would offer forgiveness and restoration. This promise really is in answer to that prayer that I mentioned that was given uh, by Solomon in chapter 6. So let's take this passage and just break it down just a little bit for us. And if you want, go ahead and put that passage up there to be a good reference for us, if you wouldn't mind. There it is. There we go. All right, go to the next verse. Let me see here. There we go. That's where I want to see. One more. I'm going to get to the right one. Oh, now we're in the good one. Here we go. Let's start with verse 14. If my people who are called by my name. Let's stop there for just a moment. He said, if my people who are called by my name. What he's re referring to here, and we're going to take it in to a more of a New Testament kind of a flavor, and we're doing that because the New Testament and Old Testament are together. You can't have one without the other. Jesus didn't get rid of the Old Testament. He fulfilled the law in the Old Testament in righteousness, and so we need both of them, and they're intertwined and interwoven with one another. But here he says, if my people who are called by my name, it starts with a relationship with God, folks. And what I mean by relationship is that you know God personally, not that you just know about him. You might know about Jesus, but you may not know Jesus personally. Here's a, a perfect illustration. It's like Aunt Andrea and I. You know, uh, why would I go to her to talk about the woman I'm going to marry because we have a relationship? I remember being with her dad out on the Chesapeake Bay at their, at their home they had out there. Um, and I remember her, her dad asking me what I wanted in, in the morning for breakfast. She said, Norm, how would you like your eggs? I love this guy. He's great. I said, I'll take them scrambled. He said, you'll take them the way I fixed them. <laughs> love her dad. Her dad was right on. 
We fished together. We broke bread together. If Andrea needed something, she can call me and I will show up. Why? Because we have a relationship. I know her. She knows me. You don't know me mostly from Adam. I'm glad my wife knows me. Praise God for that. But you don't know me from Adam. You might know a little about me. And until we can have a face-to-face, until we can sit down with one another, until we can be formally introduced and get to know each other, we cannot know each other. My mentor, or one of my mentors, he's in his 70s now, and um, even when I was first in ministry in my 20s, he um, had my parents' phone number in his book, in his phone book. Do you remember those little phone books? We didn't have those little boxes. Uh, we, we had to go home and talk on the phone. But in any case, he had my parents' home address, their phone number and everything. What that meant was he knew things about me I don't want you to know about. And he could call my parents if need be. That's the kind of relationship we have. So this is what we're really talking about here. So I have to ask the question, do you know the Lord or do you just know about him? Do you know he was born by the Virgin Mary and suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, and all these wonderful things. If you have the head knowledge, that's fine. But if you do not have a personal relationship with him, then we are, we're done. We can't go any farther here. It says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. I want you to say nobody. Turn to somebody and say Nobody. Okay, now turn to the other one and say it like you mean it. (laughs) Come on, let's get down to the reality of it. Nobody's going to come to the Father except through Jesus Christ. That means you have to have a personal relationship. You do not want to get to the place where God says he doesn't know you. It's who you know, folks. It's not what you do. It is who you know. John 1, 12, uh, in fact, John 1, 12 says this. But as many as who received him, to them he gave the power to become the children of God. Those who trusted on his name. My wife and I have one son. No matter what he does, he's always going to be my son. By the way, he's a good son. Could have had a bad one, but he's a good one. I know him well, but we have a relationship. It's a father-son relationship. If you have a relationship with God, he is your father. Understanding that some of you did not have good fathers. I get that. But try not to compare your dad here with the one up there. Because I guarantee the one up there is much better than the one even that I had. And I had a fairly good dad here on earth. It's a relationship. It is a relationship. So we have to start off with that. We have to start off with the fact that you must know Jesus first before we can even go any farther. But then we go ahead and we can read just a little bit farther into this passage. <clears throat> he says, if they humble themselves, pray and seek my face. We're going to stop there for just a minute. We need to stop there. Because after you have established a relationship, I have what I call the three must. You must do these. And there's clear reasons why we must. The first thing is humble yourself. Now, what does he mean by humble yourself? I believe, generally speaking, if I ask the following question, many of you will raise your hand. Are people basically good? Now, don't raise your hand because it's the wrong answer. People aren't basically good. If you're basically good, tell me why you went over the speed limit this morning coming to church because you was running late. Does anybody do that? Oh, there's some honest people out there. Just tell the truth. Come on, we knew that you were speeding on there. Righteous people don't do that. You with the rest of us. You unrighteous. Think about it for a moment. People who are not humble are oftentimes self-righteous, arrogant, and claims that there is nothing wrong with them or that I'm not that bad. I'm not like so-and-so. Look what they did. We get, on, we get on social media. I hate social media, except for promoting my photography stuff. I hate it. I mean, it's good for advertising. That's about it. Because people use it wrong, and we have the tendency to judge everybody else, but we don't take Michael Jackson's advice. If you want to make the world a better 
place, take a look at yourself and make a what? Change. You see? What that says to God and others, and even if ourselves, if we're lying to ourselves, that we don't need no change in our life. Humility is a wonderful thing. Sometimes God serves up an entire pie for me. Sometimes he serves up a slice. I pray there are days that he doesn't have to give me any at all. But you have to humble yourself. This is what it says in James 4.10. Humble yourselves before God and he will exalt you. There's something about being humble that allows us to accomplish things far beyond our own ability because God is able to use us in those moments. But this is the first of the three must. You must first humble yourself. You must begin and admit that I'm not as great as I think I am, that I do mess up. And by the way, I do it on a daily basis. If you don't believe me after church, ask my wife. She knows. You got to humble yourself. But the second must is just as important. It's called praying. Praying. First Thessalonians tells us to pray without ceasing in 517. Pray without ceasing. Now, praying is simply a conversation with God. Do any of you pray when you're in the car? Do you keep your eyes open? I'm just checking, and people have this tendency. We love tradition. We'll bow our head, and then you have to hit your brakes suddenly. Think about that for a minute. Praying without ceasing. Matthew puts it this way. He said, ask, and it will be given you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. But you have to ask with the right heart, too. That's why in James, the fourth chapter, it talks about you ask for the wrong reasons, and that's why you don't get what you get. Remember, I've seen dream, I dream of Jeannie. I'm dating myself. Yes, I'm 66 and a half years old, so I can do that. Some of us have seen Aladdin, and we think God is our genie. We just rub on the Bible a little bit, get on our knees and pray, and he will come to our rescue no matter what. No, we need to have a conversation with God, real conversation. Genuine conversation from the heart. One of the joys that I have in my life when we talk about having conversation is with our uh, 28, almost, well, this month, 29-year-old son. We were on a, on a trip yesterday, and we can have serious conversation. He don't always like what he want to hear. That's good. But we had some in-depth conversations, and we can have fun conversations, and that's important. That's the kind of conversation we need to have with God. He says, if you will pray, humble yourself and pray. And here's the third must. Seek God's face. Remember, seeking God's face means his presence, not just what he can do for you or me. We need to seek his face. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13 says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Not a half hiney job. That's my word. You can email me later. She'll give you the address for that comment. <laughs> Hebrews 11:6 6 says it this way. But without faith, it is impossible to, to please God, to please him. For he who comes to God must first believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. We need to seek his face. We need to seek his face. Now, if you can't do these three things after you have a relationship with God, you cannot turn from your wicked ways. And I know that's a harsh word. We don't like that word, but it's true. You must do these three things, and then you can turn from your wicked ways. See, we are wicked. We just don't know it yet. Because we can find somebody more wicked than we are, and therefore we can justify where we are at. I can't. I know what I deserve. I'm not getting that, but I know what I deserve. I've gotten grace, and I have life. How many of you have uh, grandchildren, great-grandchildren? Got any great-great-grandchildren? Okay. Any of them toddlers right now? If you have anybody who has a toddler, how many of you would send them into the bathroom at night to take their bath alone? 
How many of you believe that they're going to come out clean on the other end after an hour of being there alone? You know, a part of the reason we struggle with turning from our wicked ways is because we try to do it on our own, pull ourselves up by our own bootstrap, so to speak. I can do it. That's called pride. Instead of allowing God to fight that battle. I'm unable to have victory on my own. I know because I could give you story after story. We don't have that much time this morning of the epic failures that I have experienced in my life because I thought I could turn this thing around and did not include God at the front end who can fight the battle for me because it's only by his power that I'm able to do anything right in the first place. See, we can turn from our wicked ways if we have God do the cleaning for us. If we do the cleaning for us. You know, it's kind of interesting because he says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. I'm glad he's doing the cleaning because I'm going to miss a lot of spots. There's a places I'm not going to look, but I have a Lord who will do that. So when we talk about turning from our wicked ways, we're ultimately really basically saying that we are doing a 180-degree turn instead of running away from God because when you do something wrong, don't tell me you're running toward God. We all know we're running in the opposite direction. We don't want him to see it. Uh, you know, we don't want it. We definitely don't want him to hear about it, but he does all that already. He knows it. It's like Adam and Eve. They tried to hide. He says, where are you? He knew where they were. But with God, if we do repent, we're now running toward him. It also means that we agree with God about our sin, and we choose to allow him to do the cleaning instead of us. The result of these things, when you humble yourself, when you do the three must, and then turn away. Because see, if you can turn away from your sin by the power of God, what will happen is you'll be going toward God, and your sin can be behind you. This is when you will begin to actually experience. See, you receive forgiveness. How many of you have received forgiveness, but you're still beating yourself up for something that you did years ago or months ago or maybe hours ago? It makes no sense whatsoever, does it? It doesn't. Because when you do that, God is saying, what are you talking about? What in the world are you, what, what are you doing here? I don't remember by choice. See, the hardest person to forgive is oneself. But the beginning of life begins and living begins when we can do these other things and all of a sudden we have forgiveness in our life. There's a joy in our life. There's a peace in our life. There's an attitude that is different than what we had before because now we can look at life more clearly and see it in a way that's much more positive than when we were reveling in and having pity parties in the sin and the struggle and the pain. Does that mean that things are going to go great and nothing's going to go wrong? Oh, please. No, it doesn't. But it means that in the midst of that, you can have a joy and a peace that the rest of the world can't have because they don't have Jesus. And so when we begin to look at this passage, although it talks about repentance and such, it really comes down to one basic thing. Do you know Jesus? Some of you have been in this congregation from the very beginning. Do you know Jesus? You support the ministry with money. You play instruments. I hear you have a, a quartet here. That's your choir. I know there's four in there. You, 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 you serve on committees, you give to the food pantry. All of that becomes meaningless if you're not doing it because you have a relationship with the true and living God. That's what makes it worthwhile. This is why I do things that I do. And I go places, and I want to talk to people. I want to provide opportunities. I even love to give gifts. And if you're my server, yes, I overstep on purpose. But that's all because of Jesus and my relationship with him. And so I'm going to offer an invitation today. I do not make the assumption that just because you go to church that you are the church. Amen?
offer an invitation, but you need to know this up front. Did you know that God loves you? I'm not sure you know that. Do you know that God loves you? Did you know that God proved it? You know, it's one thing for me to say I, I, I love Andrea, but when she calls up and I can't do nothing because I say I can't do nothing, that's not love. My wife asked me to do something. If I don't have the time and don't want to put in a full heart effort in doing it, that's not love. She don't need to hear me say it. She need to see me do it. God proved it. He came down and died on the cross. He rose the third day. He ascended into heaven, sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. He's preparing a place for you and me. Go back and read the scripture. It said he's going to prepare a place. He took 2,000 years to do it. He only took six days to make the planet, and many of, much of it is gorgeous, except where we got involved. Could you imagine having a place that's made for you over 2,000 years? Oh, man. This is a garbage can compared to, to what God has planned for us. That's proving love. And he said he's coming back. That's proof that he loves us. And do you know what? He said he's coming back because he would very much love for you and I to be his people. A royal priesthood. A zealous people. A special people. Everybody in here, in God's sight, is special. And he wants a relationship with every last one of them. Not a religion. He's not interested in religion. He's interested in a relationship. He wants your heart. He wants it all. But the choice is yours. I'm going to ask you to play something nice and soft while I uh, lead in prayer. And as we pray... I know we're preparing for uh, the sacrament of Holy Communion. I'm going to ask everyone to uh, just simply bow your heads or close your eyes. And if there's anyone here who is not absolutely sure that they have a relationship with Jesus, because the scriptures say that, that as many as receive Christ, John writes, I write these things to you that you may know that you have eternal life because you've got a relationship with God. You may know you have it and that you may continue to believe and trust in the name of the Son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you haven't done that, I'm going to invite you to just simply pray this prayer. God, I thank you that you died for me. I know I'm not worthy. I know I'm not good enough. I know that you rose from the dead for me and that you want me. In fact, you're going to pick me first. And so I give my life to you, Lord, and ask you to come in and you be my Lord and Savior. You be my King. Let me come under the shadow of your wings. And I thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. So if you prayed that prayer, I want you to tell somebody after service. Tell somebody, because I want to welcome you to the family. That means you're a child of God. You're adopted, just like me and millions of others. And so we thank you for this opportunity to be here, Andrea. And we praise God for uh, what he's doing here. And may he continue to bless you in mighty ways. We are indeed adopted as brothers and sisters in Christ's family. I'm still on. 
I don't know if that's good. Can you hear me? You're, you're fine. We are indeed adopted into Christ's family. We are special. We aren't left behind. And that's why on the night in which he met for, with his disciples for the very last time, he broke bread with them. A sign, an invitation for them to, to later understand who he truly was. And so on the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, gave thanks, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant. The new covenant, the old is gone, your sins are forgiven, you are part of God's family. This new covenant was poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So I invite you to come to God's table. Know that you are his son, his daughter. He chose you. Come in joy and feast, knowing that Christ loves us, that Christ forgives us, that Christ is always there for us. Come and eat. who are serving God, as we share this meal together, I ask that you will be with us, make us one in your spirit, one in Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. That is your calling. That is our calling. Amen.
let us join together and in our closing song of thanksgiving my people will pray will you please stand Charge. 